sell my experience. What I have is something you couldn't buy. One who hasn't gone through this could never imagine it. It's every day being together, almost getting killed, helping one another. In April 1945, Frank O'Connor fought in the rugged mountains of northern Italy. As a sergeant in the United States Army, he was in the attack on a German Gothic line. Today, he is a landscape architect in Gardena, California. Rolf Frank, formerly of Berlin, is a tool and die maker living in Huntington Park, California. In 1945, as a sergeant in the German Wehrmacht's 278th Division, he too fought in Italy as a soldier in the Gothic Line. Es ist eine schlimme Sache, wenn man weiß, what an awful thing it is when you know you can't win, but you have to fight. If you quit, the next man thinks you are a coward. So each soldier says to himself, if he stays, I stay. In the last great battle in Italy, the lives of Frank Ocata and Rolf Frank come together for a brief moment. Two fighting men, one American, one German, relive that moment in history. I'm Jim Bishop. By the fall of 1944, German troops are still fighting bitterly all the way. In Italy, ahead of the advancing Allies, stretches the valley of the Po River. Its capture would mean air bases within range of heavy industry in South Germany. By winter, the iron-hard resistance of the German Gothic line stalemates the battle. To cut the German line, something special will be required something very special. January 1942. On the west coast of the United States, 110,000 Japanese and Japanese Americans, citizens and aliens alike, are ordered to close their shops and homes. They are moved to relocation camps far inland. Even the Japanese Americans within the armed forces are classified non-combat and denied the right to fight for their country. January 28, 1943. The War Department announces it will accept loyal Japanese-American volunteers for combat from the continental United States. 10,000 applications are received. 3,000 are accepted. Two days later, the 442nd Regimental Combat Team is formed at Camp Shelby, Mississippi. Most of the men of Japanese descent who come to Shelby were born in the United States. They are called Nisei. One of the volunteers is 22-year-old Frank Okada. Everything we do, we try to do faster and better. At Camp Shelby, we know that we have to prove ourselves. With that in mind, we form the slogan, Go For Broke. Live, die, or otherwise, you just go all out. Also incorporated in the team is the 100th Infantry Battalion composed of Hawaiians of Japanese ancestry. In August 1943, the Hawaiian section is sent to the European Theater for Combat, and the 442nd continues its training at Camp Shelby. Our company has men from every walk of life. Nisei, boys who were born here. 
Kibes, boys born in the United States but raised in Japan. Kanakas, boys from Hawaii. One day at Camp Shelby, we stand IG inspection. A general comes by, looks at us, and then says, these boys are ready. Someone next to me says, that's the kiss of death right there. Right after that, we get shipped out. June 10th, 1944. The 442nd arrives in Italy and is rejoined by the battle-tested 100th Battalion. crossing of the Rapido River to the storming of Monte Cassino, through Salerno, Anzio, through the bloodiest fighting in southern France and Italy, the 442 has won for itself a special reputation. Our outfit was formed to spearhead and fight in the mountains. When we get into battle, we just go right ahead. Our casualties are high. Men who go into the hospital want to get out and return to the front line. Otherwise, they figure they are wasting their time. One fellow from the islands, more educated than the rest, is always brushing his teeth and combing his hair. Everybody kids him. What the heck? I guess he wants to die looking clean. The first week in battle, he gets it. He gets hit for brushing his teeth. Of course, if you rest around too long, you don't want to go up on the line. You start thinking how good it is to live. While you're up there, you don't think about living. Stretched across the rugged Apennine Mountains is the last German line of defense in northern Italy, the Gothic Line. Sixteen German divisions dug in for a last-ditch battle. The line is solid. As spring approaches, it is made ready for the expected Allied offensive. One of the soldiers manning the Gothic line is a 26-year-old veteran of the Russian and Italian campaigns, Sergeant Rolf Frank. It will come, the day when we pull back to the Alps, and that is what we will try to do. But now we must stop them, so that we have a chance to pull back. Here in the mountains, it is easy to defend. You dig yourself in so the enemy can't see you. You can keep them down with only machine guns. But actually, we have only 80 shots for our cannons a day. We can fire them. We have to have special permission. During the day, it is almost impossible to travel because of enemy fighters. They pick you up and come down for even a single man on the road. Whatever they see moving, they come down for. superiority, the Allies have reduced communications between the Gothic Line and the German homeland to a threat. Operation Strangle, as the punitive bombing is called, makes the movement of supplies or men extremely hazardous. Those that make it through make it only at night. The Allied battle plan calls for two diversionary attacks, one on either side of the Gothic Line, a few days apart to draw German forces away from the center. Then, a week later, the major assault, ramrodding through the center of the line straight for Bologna and command of the Po Valley. March 1945, the 442nd moves to Leghorn, Italy. It is to be a part of the 92nd Division. The 442 moves up to spearhead the diversionary attack on the left. Jump off is less than a week away. 
By now, their reputation as a top U.S. troubleshooting team has been solidly established. It's 1945. The big guns of the American artillery signal the beginning of the 440 seconds diversionary attack on the German Gothic line. steep, but they didn't say how steep. This thing is almost straight up, and the enemy is on top. I say to the captain, you'll get us slaughtered when we get up there. I imagine they're waiting. He says, I imagine. When the shelling starts, the whole ground shakes, and all around you hear crying, and there's no enemy to see. We expect an attack, but we saw that would come from up north, like at Anzio. Ahead of the 442 lies Mount Belvedere and German troops that have had five months to harden their defense line. April 5th, 1945. The U.S. 442nd Regimental Team strikes for Mount Belvedere and a break through the German Gothic line. Assigned the defense of Mount Belvedere is the crack machine gun battalion Kesselring. The veteran German troops bar the way with a crossfire of mortar and machine gun fire. You know, if they got one guy sitting there with a machine gun, he can hold up the attack for hours. One man, one machine gunner can cut you to ribbons and you can't even see him. You fight, you fight, you fight, and suddenly they come again, and again, and again. They do it all the time. I don't know why. And they lose a lot of people. A lot of people. The only way to get them is to go in and dig them out. We call it a bonsai attack. God, do we lose men.
days after the attack, in spite of heavy German reinforcements brought in from the center of the line, Mount Belvedere falls. The Germans we capture know we're Japanese, but they can't figure out why we're fighting them. Isn't Germany allied with Japan? So we tell them, haven't you heard? Japan is now fighting with the Allies. April 9th, the British 8th Army begins the second diversionary attack. Hits the Germans on the other end of the line. The main 5th Army attack through the center of the German line is held up because of bad weather. The 442nd Spearhead moves out so far in front that their supply columns can't keep pace. We have them on the run and we want to keep them on the run, hoping that the other end of our line will move along too. You get out here and you wonder what the heck it's all about. Then you realize you're shooting because if you don't, you're going to get shot. When you come right down to it, infantry fighting throughout the world is not fought on a big basis. It is fought by squads and companies. Under attack at both ends of the line, the major blow in the middle catches the Germans off balance. The 90th Panzer Grenadier Division is rushed to the front. It's a desperate attempt to prevent a complete breach in the line. It's the last German reserve division in Italy and it is committed before the attack is one day old. Three days after the main attack, the Gothic line begins to crumble. Fifth Army commands the heights, and beneath them stretches the valley of the Po. They send those big airplanes, the flying fortresses, to make it easier for them. And we feel like trapped rats. I'm maybe three or four kilometers away from the front lines. I notice an awful fire and the airplanes. We have to sometimes hide, and later we have no chance to hide at all. Now there is not enough left to make a real front. I figure my life is not worth much now. gets a message, there is a breakthrough. Everybody tries to leave and go north. Some with trucks, some without trucks. Any way they can. This area is all mountains. It is hard to proceed. April 
13th, the 5th and 8th Armies are converging on Bologna. Three days later, the American 34th Division fights its way into the city. The race for the Alps is on. All along the 5th Army front, German forces are trying to break away, to slip out from under the Allied heel. The Germans' last hope reached the Po River before the Allies. We can walk by day. By night, we can proceed either. I talk with men from the tanks, and they have to blow them up because of no gasoline. And we have to destroy our weapons or else the enemy will get them. Everybody is running, running, running. They don't care about anything. I know that many of the others feel the same way, that we will be lucky if we stay alive until the end of the war. You have a chance to survive if you become a prisoner. Survival, it's a matter of survival. April 28th, elements of the American First Armored reached the foot of the Alps. Now the Gothic line is only a memory, and the German retreat has turned into a rout. April 29th, the entire German 148th Division surrenders. At 2 p.m. on the same day, the German High Command in Italy agrees that full surrender should be effective on May 2nd. In just 19 days, the Allies have driven from the Apennines to the Alps, and have brought the war in Italy to an end. Sergeant Rolf Frank, captured by the 5th Army, spends 10 months in U.S. prison camps and finally returns to his home in Berlin. Frank Okada, now a first sergeant, spends the rest of the war in northern Italy. By the time the men of the 442nd come home, they have received more than 18,000 individual decorations more presidential citations than any other unit in U.S. history. President Truman awarding them their seventh citation for their role in the Gothic Line campaign, said at the time, you are now on your way home. You fought not only the enemy, but you fought prejudice, and you won. Changing. There's only one possibility of saving UN Circle troops from total annihilation. That is the honorable surrender of this town. If you reject our proposal, six battalions are ready to annihilate you and your troops. 
all the serious civilian losses would not correspond with the well-known American humanity. What is your answer? Nuts. Werner Polchow was a first lieutenant in the German army, in command of a mortar unit. In December 1944, he took part in Hitler's most audacious plan, the Ardennes Offensive. Today, he sells building materials in Mannheim, Germany. Es ist nun 20 Jahre her, seit der Rundstedt Offensive und Weihnachten bei Bastogne. It's 20 years since the Rundstedt Offensive and that Christmas near Bastogne. A farmer and his family befriended us. I'm sure they realized that people on both sides were basically the same. Leroy Valheim is a tile contractor in Fresno, California. During the German Ardennes Offensive, he was a U.S. Army sergeant, the commander of a light reconnaissance tank. We were using our tank as a decoy. We'd move out into the open, let the enemy take a pot shot at us, then radio artillery to zero in. It was just a matter of who was going to get who first. During 1944, in the snow-covered Ardennes forest of Belgium, the lives of Werner Polchow and Leroy Valheim crossed. Two fighting men, one German, one American, relived that moment in history. In 1944, the Allied armies in Europe are threatening the German homeland itself. Hitler is much like an animal at bay. He must strike back or perish. He believes that a heavy concentration of troops in one supreme and daring effort may turn the clock back to 1940, drive the Americans and the British all the way back to the Channel ports, and force them into a negotiated peace. It is a desperate risk, but Hitler must take it. Hitler first approaches his plan in September 1944 as the British and American forces prepare their final smash into Germany. In the center of the front is a rugged 85-mile area, the Ardennes Forest. The plan, a surprise attack punching through the weak spot in overwhelming numbers, seize several road junctions and river bridges, then drive to the sea at Antwerp, then squeeze as they did in 1940. Although several generals feel the plan much too ambitious to be sustained, all follow the Fuhrer. Late in October, the Germans begin secretly moving their units to points east of the Ardennes without arousing allied suspicions. 25 divisions, a quarter million men, roll toward the Western Front. Attached to the 2nd Panzer Division is a mortar unit commander, Lieutenant Werner Polchow. Two days ago, my mortar group was ordered out from the Westwall bunkers and sent to this regrouping area. There's a coming and going like I have not seen for some time. There are very many modern and good war eagles and quite a few highly decorated officers and soldiers from other fronts. Also, many young soldiers who never before have seen battle. They are excited from all this activity and weapons. From the outside look of things, it seems that a whole new army has come into existence. Aliens fleeing Germany and Luxembourg provide hints of troop concentrations. Captured German soldiers tell Allied captors an attack is being mounted. When a first army intelligence officer warns it might come in the Ardennes, his colleagues suggest he suffers from battle fatigue. All agree the Germans are on their last legs. They can't possibly launch a counter-offensive. North of the Ardennes, the Allies have 16 divisions poised on the approaches to Germany's western border. Half of them battle-wise, but exhausted. The rest, green and untested. 
south of the forest, there are 10 American divisions preparing for an offensive into Germany's Saar region. The American Third Army under General George Patton is scheduled to begin the attack on December 19th. One of Patton's tankers in the 4th Armored Division is Sergeant Leroy Valheim. Our outfit has been off the line for about a week now. The mud and goo more or less neutralized us, so we're taking a breather and working over our tanks, changing oil, tightening up the tracks, and fixing everything that accumulates from day to day when you're on the go. In about another week, we'll probably be shoving off again. Right now, though, everybody is enjoying the extra shut-eye we're getting. The order is given. General von Manteu says to the officers in our division, Gentlemen, let's go. Cross the river Meuse and reach Antwerp without looking left or right. That is the shortest order I ever have received. We old, experienced soldiers feel that this attack can only be the last struggle. But the young men are impressed. They have enthusiasm. They believe the war can be turned in our favor. Early morning, December 16th, a shattering barrage of German artillery and rocket fire lights the skies. for the next several days provides effective cover for the German might that floods the road. In the center, the Germans gouge a 12-mile corridor to the approaches of Bastogne. They are ordered to surround and bypass this town, then drive for the River Meuse, the first goal. confusion. Communications are sketchy. American troops suddenly discover Germans in front and behind them. Panzers under cover of fog and rain slip into American armored columns, then blast the Americans off the road. So far, the resistance has been sporadic. The Americans are caught off guard by the surprise of our attack. They don't know what all the shooting is about, since it is coming from every direction. Ten thousand troops of the Green U.S. 106th Division, the Golden Lion, are encircled by the Germans. Their officers see no way out. More than seven thousand soldiers of the 106th destroy their arms and give up. Next to Bataan, this is the largest mass surrender in American military history. German deceptions wear on the nerves of U.S. troops. English-speaking German soldiers in American uniforms, even Jeeps, infiltrate American positions. They are few in number, their acts are limited. But the psychological effect of their penetration is enormous. Soon every stranger in American uniform is suspect. Passwords go out the window. Unless you know modern American folklore, you're in trouble. 
One American general is held in a cellar by MPs for five hours because he doesn't know how many home runs Babe Ruth hit in his best year. Fifteen thousand American airborne troops are rushed as reserves to defense positions around Bastogne. In command, General Anthony McAuliffe, acting commander of the 101st Airborne Division. Right near Bastogne, our unit encounters very strong fire from the American infantry. They are skillful with their defenses, so our panzers bypass the town. Then we bring up our mortars and artillery and start firing on the enemy emplacement. shattered, other Americans fight isolated holding actions. Cooks, orderlies, supply personnel pick up guns, fight as infantry. So do the engineers and artillery men. Gradually, small scattered units hold up the German advance, especially around San Vith. Hitler's timetable, two days to the Meuse, is upset. On battle maps, the German salient quickly has taken on the appearance of a bulge extending well into a wide position. The Ardennes offensive becomes known as the Battle of the Bulge. It doesn't take long for orders to come down from headquarters. We get two hours to load our tanks with extra gas and be ready to pull out. I'm in command of a light tank with a crew of three men. One man goes after rations, Another gathers up our bedding, while two of us tend to the tank. It's one big rush. But by 2200, we, and I guess the rest of the division, are ready to shove off. It becomes obvious Hitler is risking everything in one last desperate military gamble. On the third day, General Eisenhower orders General Patton's third army to attack the German flank and relieve Bastogne. Patton, with his army 125 miles south of the Bulge, replies with a near impossible statement. We attack the day after tomorrow. December 20th. The Battle of the Bulge is in its fifth day. American forces are reeling under the impact of the mighty German offensive. General Patton and his Third Army are driving north toward Bastogne to counterattack. A freeze sets in so the roads can support the heavy armor. The whole division is on the go. Somebody must be in a hell of a hurry because every vehicle is ordered to drive with lights on. It's definitely not according to the book, but we're making fast time. Between looking out for enemy planes and watching the tank running ahead of us, I feel like a swivel head. Each man takes his turn at driving while the rest of us sleep curled up in our seats. Radio silence is being maintained, so there's no way of knowing what's up. We just follow along and hope the guy leading the column knows where he's heading. December 21st. It's snowing throughout the Ardennes. Sand Vith falls to the Germans. Now the center route across the Ardennes is wide open. The Germans flow around Bastogne on all sides, drawing a noose of steel about the beleaguered garrison. For the past 48 hours, 
We have been fighting in close quarters with the enemy. Even my mortar crew fights now as infantry. Every minute has its crisis. We are shooting, throwing grenades, and doing even worse things. Otherwise, you cannot hope to survive. December 22nd, the situation in Bastogne grows desperate. Ammunition is short. McAuliffe's artillery battalions are down to 10 rounds per gun. The American casualties reach an average of 1,200 men a day. The Germans send an emissary to Bastogne with an ultimatum to surrender or be destroyed. General McAuliffe's reply is short and to the point. Nuts. The same day, Patton's advance columns reach the southern flank of the bulge. The German 7th Army is prepared for them. There's no hope of a quick breakthrough to relieve the town. so thick you can't see more than a hundred yards we've come a long way and now no one can say for sure where we are or where the enemy is I begin to think we're lucky it's foggy or we might be sitting ducks in this narrow road the next day December 23rd dawns bright and sunny perfect flying weather the defenders of Bastogne cheer as Allied planes fly overhead to bomb and strafe the enemy. And more important, to drop supplies. Not all that's needed, but enough to enable the Americans to hang on. is now 10 days old. For this night, we are quartered in an old barn. When we took it over, the owners disappeared. While we are singing our Christmas carols, the farmer returns with his whole family. We invite them to join our celebration. Everything we have in food, cigarettes and schnapps, we divide evenly. For the moment, we forget about the war. Nobody knows what the general situation is. What we hold is ours and that's all. Right now, it's a barnyard with a couple pieces of artillery we're protecting. Christmas Day. Word is received that the western spearhead of the German 2nd Panzer Division has been stopped, just short of the Meuse. It's not good news to the men of Bastogne. They anticipate the powerful tank division will now turn back to hit them. They're right. Hitler is told by his generals that they can't reach the Meuse, much less the English Channel. Furious, he orders an all-out attack on Bastogne. Some of our 
consequences break into Bastogne itself this morning. But the Americans put up very strong opposition. They still hold the town. I'm directing more fire on the enemy positions. We are spotted, and right away, heavy artillery fire comes raining down all around us. Our battery is destroyed by a direct hit. I am wounded and evacuated to the rear. On the afternoon of December 26th, a tank unit of Patton's 4th Armored Division punches a hole through to Bastogne. The next day the corridor is widened. The siege is over, but not the fighting. We're on the left flank of the road running to Bastogne, cleaning out the woods. Twice the Germans cut behind us, but infantrymen riding on the back of our tanks managed to round them up. On January 3rd, the Allies launch a three-pronged counterattack. The 3rd Army continues its northward drive. The 1st Army continues south. And the British 30th Corps pushes in from the west. By January 16th, patrols from the 1st and 3rd Armies meet north of Bastogne. By early February, the Germans have been thrown back to where they started. Even here in the rear, it's obvious from the great air power of the Americans how this battle will end. We cannot win. Brave men have died for nothing. So said the wife who forget the terrible times. They will talk and remember differently. Other people who listen, especially the young, will come to the conclusion they have fought us for a joyful war. How wrong that would be. We've lost a lot of equipment and quite a few men. So we're pulling back to get reorganized. We'll draw new equipment and train new men. Then we'll be coming back up on the line again. That's for sure. It was a remarkable feat in itself for Patton's Third Army, poised to strike eastward, to turn north and race 125 miles to the Bastogne area in just two days. But more important, Patton's units arrived prepared to fight immediately. Their entry into the battle doomed the last German offensive of World War II. Sergeant Leroy Valheim fights on with Patton's Third Army and wins the bronze and silver stars for bravery. The end of the European war finds him in Czechoslovakia, a newly commissioned second lieutenant. After being wounded, Lieutenant Werner Polchow spends some time in a German hospital. Then, still partly crippled, he serves out the war as a non-combatant. In May, he is taken prisoner in the Ruhr Valley by the Americans. Hitler's last offensive, the Battle of the Bulge, caught the Allies by surprise. For a brief exultant period, it raised German morale both in the army and at home. But in the end, the Bulge was turned into still another German defeat. The Germans had spent their tanks and fighting men. Little was left.